okay so welcome all of you welcome to this second webinar of together which is about a women's journey and we all know that the journey of womanhood is wonderful get complex right from being a child to a teenager and later a woman the female's body undergoes innumerable changes however beautiful and significant these changes might be there are certain underlying causes that affects one's physical and mental health more often these changes are accepted rather than being making efforts to understand and adjusting our bodies towards this change and often this lack of understanding and knowledge of these complications by a woman leads to serious health issues so here in this webinar today we have a very special guest dr aparna cha senior consultant obstetrician gynecologist from apollo cradle brookfield who will enlighten everyone with certain diseases and psychological problems and general concerns that are associated with the different stages in the development of a female's body so i uh, a very warm, warm welcome to dr aparna thank you so thank much you. for coming here today and you know having uh, decided uh, to spend some time with all of us so i will uh, not waste much time just hand over the session to you directly a small request to all of you who are here in the session i'd request all of you to keep your uh, zoom calls in mute for some time so you'll be given a fair chance to ask uh, any questions that you want at the end of the sessions so either you raise your hand or you could even write down your questions in the chat box below so doctor will take a fair amount of time to and try answering all your questions so doctor uh, the floor is all yours thank you rima thanks for such wonderful introduction and thank you for introducing womanhood so nicely that <laughs> was really good i mean for for a for a non medico to uh, to explain it so well uh though i'm not habituated to this kind of thing but then last one and a half month it's going on and on and on and this would be right probably my fourth or fifth webinar where i am like you know talking to talking to the screen and couple of pictures we are always used to getting a human touch giving a human touch uh nevertheless uh, the journey should go on it shouldn't stop knowledge is something which we have to give to each other uh and i'm here today to talk about a women's journey now frankly speaking i'm also tired of talking about covid-19 in pregnancy and i'm sure all of you have got a lot of information though i'm here to answer to those questions also i'm not going to put them on my uh, ppt or on my agenda but then if at all you need something to to uh, answer for me to answer i would do that as of now today i am on a women's journey starting from uh, i would not say that i would start it from the childhood but yes of course i would start it definitely from uh, just a minute so i would start it from the from this so let's talk about uh, puberty reproductive age group perimenopausal age group and postmenopausal age group each one of us when we start we start from from childhood go to reproductive uh, puberty and from there reproductive age and then perimenopause and postmenopause each stage is as beautiful as it is on its own and each stage has its own issues has its own problems each stage has its own joy so uh, not not exactly as because i am a doctor to so uh, of course yes i would talk about joys but more more about the problems if if there is what all are the common problems what we go through these stages so if you can see the screen there's a there's a young girl a young beautiful girl blooming with happiness and probably some disturbances also she is a pubertal girl probably 13 14 and um, so what happens to this puberty when so puberty we call it as from 10 years to 15 years roughly uh, okay so whatever age group i have given those are very very rough age group according to the uh, according to the geographic region of the world these age group vary 
So in India, right now, we call it as 10 to 15 years as the age group of puberty. So if at all, there is no change into the, uh, there's no change into the body before, after 15 years, or if at all, there are much more changes into the body before 10 years, there is a concern, there's a question mark. So that's when a mother or a girl should be approaching the doctor. Now coming to the stages of puberty, uh, the first stage is called as telark, the second one is called as pubark, and the last one is called as menarch. Telark is the one when the breast development starts. Pubark is the one wherein the other sex secondary sexual characters like, you know, the uh, uh, hair growth, uh, private parts hair growth, they start. And menarch is the one finally when the girl gets her pe first periods. That's called menarch. Now, uh, very often, very, very often, we come across with these issues, uh, uh, irregular cycle during puberty. A mother comes with a concern that doctor, my patient, uh, my daughter had a bleeding uh, probably last December. And after that, for the next three months or four months, she's not been having any periods. And now all of a sudden today she's bleeding torrentially. Or there's another group of person, who, a group of female who comes saying that doctor, my daughter is having every cycle every month, but she hardly bleeds for a minute, for a day or half day. And it stops. Is that normal? Now, how I put it across is this, that there is something called human HPO axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, and ovarian axis. So this is the axis on which all the hormones work. And finally, as in how they have worked for a couple of years, it becomes, uh, you know, what we, what we call it as expert. So in the beginning, this running is really not an expert running. The, sometimes the hypothalamus forgets to give right signal to pituitary, sometimes pituitary forgets to take the right signal from hypothalamus, sometimes ovaries don't work. So finally, we get a situation wherein one cycle she would bleed, another cycle she would not bleed. Also, because her ovaries are not ovulating, she is not getting her uh, eggs formed. So that is the reason why her periods are not being so regular. That's the reason for which I have put this, uh, this point here, that mothers shouldn't be bothered, or the girls should not be bothered till the age of 13, 14, or 15, if she is not having her very much particularly regular cycle. That is a normal thing that happens. The second common issue during uh, this is painful cycle. Lot of girls, they get very bad cramps during her periods, during the beginning phases of their periods. Most of the time, these painful cycles are considered normal cycles, are considered normal. That could, it could be a physiological pain. It could be because when the endometrium sheds out, the inner layer of the uterus sheds out, there are a lot of prostaglandins which get formed, and that is a normal thing. We tell the patient to take probably a painkiller or even if she does not want to take the painkiller, probably some yoga, probably some exercises, good hydration that works out very, very well. Nutrition part, another thing very important, the deficiency of vitamin B12, vitamin D, this may cause a lot of pain. Calcium deficiency, that is another reason why there could be a painful cycle. And it's not only in puberty, it's also post puberty I mean, during the reproductive age group also, if there is a painful cycle, that could be because of the deficiency of the nutrients or the minerals. So one should be taking care of this, that the minerals, the vitamins are well replenished. Now coming to this, if you can see this, there is, uh, this is called as reproductive age group. We started roughly from 18 years, and goes till 45. Earlier, they used, we used to say that it starts from somewhere around, uh, starting point was always 18, 19, but yeah, the ending point was probably 40, 41. But now we have reached till 45 years of age. And the reason for this enhancement in the age for reproductive age group is mainly the nutrition part. People have become much more uh, aware about the nutrition, the basal metabolic rate has increased, and uh, that is how the hormones also have starting a lot of changes. Puberty also starts a little early, reproductive age group goes a little far, 
post menopause goes a little more far now coming to this stages of uh, this reproductive age group one is this premarital age status or you know we are not married you are young you are you're like energetic and i'm sure many of my listeners are into that phase right now that is the first stage second is uh, comes as pregnancy once you get married or marriage or no marriage pregnancy is there uh, and then the the third thing is motherhood uh, each stage is beautiful each stage is is full of joy full of uh, you know excitement full of newness lot of newness a uh, couple of a uh, couple of issues which are there in the uh, age group of puberty also get carried into premarital state uh, age group or also get carried into the reproductive age group now there's this thing which comes up quite frequently which is called as premenstrual syndrome i am sure almost each of us would have gone through this stage this problem once once in a while in our lifetime in our pregnant uh, in our period cycle premenstrual syndrome means a cycle a syndrome which comes just one or two days or three or four days or a week prior to our cycle we get we feel slightly irritated we feel a little lethargic we having a little bit of headache some bloating sensation not feeling like having food a uh, lot of acidity not feeling like going to work station and uh, like you know having no reason to fight with the boyfriend or with the partner or with the with husband whomsoever but then this is what is called as pms or premenstrual syndrome now this what, what i told you is a very mild form of pms the pms when we come across into the, our clinical practice we sometimes come across the pms a very severe pms also patient may come to me saying that uh, doctor i feel like committing suicide doctor i i i just don't feel like going to my workstation i feel like quitting some of them they actually have physical issues it's not only that they have mental issues they actually start vomiting they have bad headache they have a lot of abdominal pain and they they literally you know uh, wince into pain they come to the hospital get the uh, uh, we we do the battery of tests because sometimes the patient comes in such bad form that we ourselves also also confused though we know that it is pms and there would be nothing physically when we so do a scan but still sometimes we do a scan and to our surprise there is nothing in the scan there is nothing in the blood test there is nothing in the urine test so it is just the hormonal change the hormones can do any type of wonder it can do bad it can do good so when you have a pms you know you need to tell yourself at least 10 times if you have a bad pms if you have a severe pms you have to tell yourself that this is normal i am not abnormal this is something which is going to pass through i just have to wait for another one two or three days and it would pass through i don't have to think that i'm diseased so these all are the positive things which you have to keep saying to yourself okay and apart from this of course your you know you will have to take care of your hydration that's very very important hydration not only during pms time but in general if your hydration level is good your pms will be lesser if your calcium levels are good your pms will be lesser so get your get your vitamins and minerals tested keep making sure that you do take those vitamins and minerals time you know time to time just to make sure that your pms is better try not to remain aloof during that time if you have a severe pms try not to smoke at all try to be refrain from alcohol completely if you have pms and if you have pain lot of periods pain lot of cramps lot of menstrual cramp do not hesitate to take one or one or two antispasmodic once in a month if you are taking some antispasmodic that's not going to harm your body too much if i compare it with the with the thing what you go through those 2 3 days compared to that it is not a very very severe thing 
uh, or a very uh, much more complications thing. You can have one or two Miftal's pass or paracetamol or brufin, whatever works for you. Yes, of course, when there is, as I told you, when there's a very bad PMS, we do get sometimes a scan done just to figure out if, the, if there is any ovarian cyst or if there is any endometriosis, stuff like that. But most of the time we realize that there is nothing. So that is one of the common issues what we see in the reproductive age group. The another is continuing the same irregular cycle. Uh, irregular cycle, it, say if I have 100 females who have irregular cycle, 10 of them, would be genetically irregular. They are called constitutionally irregular cycle. They have nothing, they have no PCO, they have no thyroid, they're not obese, nothing. It has, uh, you know, the whole body system is all fine. Only when, I, only when I ask her the history, a lot of digging into the history, then I realize that she says that, doctor, my mother also gave me similar kind of thing, that her periods do not re you would not remain so regular during the early days. And my sister also had similar complaint. And that's when we get to know that probably it is constitutional. So the people, the girls whom, whom, who have gone through the battery of tests and realized that there is nothing should be less bothered about their irregular cycle. There are people who have cycle of 45 days, 40 to 45 days. So more than the length of the cycle, it's about the regularity of the cycle. If the cycle is 40 to 45 days, then it is not to be bothered. So uh, here I would just come across, uh, you know, I would just give you a brief about the regular cycle. When we say the cycle is regular, it means it could be anything 21 plus or minus 7. Uh, sorry, 28 plus or minus 7 means 21 day cycle is also considered regular. 35 day cycle is also considered regular. The same way the bleeding, 5 plus or minus 2 days. If your period is 3 days, then also it is fine. If your period is 7 days, then also it is fine. Pain or no pain. If the pain is only for the first one or two days and after that there is no pain, Please don't worry about it. If your pain is uh, uh, like, you know, continuing for next two days or three days, then probably you need to look into, into this that it's being normal or not. But one or two days of beginning spasmodic pain is considered normal. The third, the fourth thing is clots. If you're passing a little bit of clot, one or two clots in a day, that's considered normal. Don't worry. Sometimes a premenstrual or a postmenstrual spotting of a day or two is also considered normal. So keep these things into mind and then look into your cycle. If you still feel that your cycles are irregular, come back to your doctor. Now the very common reasons for your, for your abnormal or irregular cycle, what we see, the most commonly common thing is PCOD, polycystic ovarian disease. There's a, it's a huge term. It's a, it's a big term. Well, there's something called PCOD. There's something called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Most of the time, we use the word either this or that, one of that. I mean, we, can, we do replace the word. If I go very, very deep down into the words, these two words are slightly different from each other. In the sense, PCOS covers PCOD. Not all the PCOD is uh, and in PCOS, we cover the PCOD. PCOS means polycystic ovarian syndrome, wherein it's not necessary that your ovaries in your scan would show a picture of multiple cysts, but your, you still have your periods irregular. You still have those symptoms of polycystic ovary. So that is called PCOS, which also, which also takes into account of severe obesity, sometimes a lot of stress, all these things causes same kind of hormonal imbalance in your body as your polycystic ovarian disease. So if your scanning says that there are multiple cysts, then we call it as PCOD, provided that you have a symptom of it. If your scanning does not say that there is multiple cysts, but still you have a symptom, we call it as polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, the baseline of this PCOD or PCOS is this, that, I mean, in layman language, I 
can t- I, I'm t- telling you that, you know, the male hormone of your body starts taking the upper hand and the female hormone starts going down. So the estrogen and the progesterone, okay, they start becoming lesser. The androgen or the testosterone starts becoming higher. The reason is this, that those multiple small cysts, they are, they are filled with some fluid, which causes luteinizing hormone to go up, LH to go up. When this LH goes up, you get this uh, androgen surge or your testosterone surge. And that's when the whole thing starts coming up. You start having your periods irregular. You start having your scanty periods. You start having sometimes painful periods. Your ovulation does not happen. You start having hairs at the places where a f- normally a female will not have, a male will have like, you know, jawline hairs, uh, 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 hairs uh, at, at, at a place where it should not be. And you start losing your hairs. You start having oily skin. You start having acne. So all these are puberty changes of a guy of a boy a boy when he grows this is exactly what happens with him in a little more aggressive form in a PCOD females it happens in a little lesser form that's because the androgen of our body has started increasing the same thing happens in obesity and exactly the same thing happens in severe stress also so all these three four words are interlinked PCOS stress Obesity. Now, when we do a hormonal test, we exactly see the same thing. In all these three conditions, the luteinizing hormone is going up, the follicular stimulating hormone is coming down, and this is where the unbalance or the debalance comes up. Now, what's the answer? What can we do for it? Rather, can we do something for it? Yes, we can. We can. Now, we know. We know that what was the uh, one is this that that we had those multiple cysts in the ovary. But what about those who did not have it, but still having the problem? What about them? What about those obese females? What about those stressed out females? What what is happening to them? What's happening to them is that when there is an obesity or when there's a stress, there is this estrogen hormone, which is there in every female's body, which is the good estrogen is called as estradiol. Now, this good estrogen is the one which is the main reason of her periods to come or of her, you know, feminization to happen. Okay. Now, this estradiol goes into peripheral fat and gets converted into estriol or estratriol. Okay. I'm, I'm using a lot of words now. Forget about this. I'm just trying to tell you that this estrogen goes into peripheral fat and gets converted into a bad chemical. What can we do? We can remove this peripheral fat. We can reduce the peripheral fat. So that's the answer for PCOD. I know it may it may sound difficult. It may sound quite uh, pessimistic at times, saying this that doctor, you're you're telling me every time to reduce my weight. I'm unable to reduce it. But there's no other answer for it. There's absolutely no other answer for it. As in how your peripheral fat reduces, your insulin resistance reduces, your insulin sensitivity increases, your androgen reduces in your body. So the whole lot of thing is related to this peripheral fat. Now there's another difficult part of PCOD is called as non-obese or lean PCOD. Frankly, we are yet to crack the way by which we can treat them. Though we treat them with the medicines, that's a different thing. But is there any lifestyle change? There also they say that exercises do release some uh, serotonins or neurotransmitters, which does help in containing this Easter day all in body. And that does have a huge help in treating PCOD. Otherwise, PCOD is a disease which will be with you forever. And which will, uh, you know, which may nag you time to time if you are not taking care of your body. If you do take care of your body, if you do good amount of exercises, if you make sure that you don't put on weights, PCOD generally does not bother you. Now, there are a couple of still unfortunate people who do take care of their body and still they have this issues. When, when the periods are irregular or when they want to conceive, they are unable to conceive. That's when we come into picture. We give her medications. 
we help her with the medication so that she conceives or so that her periods becomes regular the another very common reason of a regular cycle is thyroid issue hypothyroidism 30 to 40 percent of the time 50 percent of the time rather hypothyroidism or the thyroid level being low in your body your tsh being high when you see the report it's a vice versa we do very generally get a test done called tsh thyroid stimulating hormone when you have less thyroid hormone in your body this tsh would go up so i get a very long very often a query saying that doctor my tsh is high then why are you giving me thyroid hormone that's because if you do not have enough amount of thyroid hormone in your body that's when your tsh go, go high so 50 percent of it is because of uh, genetic reasons probably mother, probably father, or probably sister, or aunt, or bua, one of them would be having thyroid, and the gene crosses to the female, and she also shows the symptom, or she also has her TSH being higher in her body. But not always this is true. Again, this is stress-induced hypothyroidism. Again, there is a lot of uh, pollution, polluted food, or a lot of chemical food, a lot of junk food, which may cause hypothyroidism too so that is why i have kept that also in the same category exercise is one of the wonderful boon for hypothyroid patients especially when they are very mild hypothyroid when their tsh level is just 5.5 6 6.5 7 we actually tell them to do good amount of exercise and it comes down the thyroid level tsh level comes down Another very common issue, painful and heavy cycle. Yeah, this is again a very common thing. Again, we need to look into the history. You need to look into the history of your mother's cycle, your daughter, your uh, sister's cycle, or your very close, like, you know, first degree uh, relative, like your aunt or your boa, her cycles. If their cycles were very painful and very heavy, probably you have got it into your genes and you don't have to do much about it. But then, if it is beyond a limit, if you are being anemic because of your cycles, if you're, if, you're, if you're losing so much of blood that your body is showing the compensatory mechanism in terms of having hemoglobin low, that's when you need to get in touch with your doctor. We generally do a couple of blood tests and we do an ultrasound to figure out if there is a fibroid or if there's a polyp or if there is something called ovarian cyst or if there is something called endometriosis, those kind of things. And if there is something like, if there is actually a functional disorder or actually a structural disorder, we do take care of that. The, the next thing is wide discharge. Now, uh, if I may have to put it in percentage wise, on daily basis OPD, around 20% of the OPD covers up this wide discharge. I mean, you know, 20% of the females in the OPD, if I'm seeing 100 OPD in a day, right, right, almost 18 to 20 of them would be coming for this wide discharge. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to emphasize upon few points, which you can keep it in your mind, and then scrutinize your own wide discharge and get to know whether it is a normal one or not. And if it is not fitting into that normal category, then of course you can come to one of us. So now what happens is this, that a uh, white uh, discharge is something which is like, uh, it's, it's a regular discharge from your vaginal area, okay? Why is this discharge important? This discharge is very, very important for keeping the area moist, the area lubricated, so that when there's a sexual contact, there's a pleasure, there's not much of dysfunction, there's not much of pain. And another reason why it is important is this, that that moist fluid, it makes sure that only the good bacteria or the regular vaginal flora flourishes in the vagina and not the uh, pathological bacteria. That's the reason. If there is very much dryness into the vagina of some female, she would have her infections a little more commonly common. So it is not true always that if you have a wide discharge, that means it is an infection. It is actually a, a natural defense mechanism of the body. Now, what do we know? 
How do we know that it is actually the natural defense mechanism and not an infective discharge? Is this that if there is a discharge, which is quantity, I'm not going to quantify it. Okay. Now, why I'm telling you I'm not going to quantify it is because, say, there are some people who sweat a little more. There are some who sweat a little less. That doesn't mean that if there is somebody who's sweating a little more is having a problem. No, it's not always necessary. It could be this, that she, she or he, his or her sweat gland is a little more active. And the same way about this, uh, you know, uh, the glands over there. So now, uh, if the discharge is non-smelly, if the discharge is not with black tinge, if the discharge is kind of colorless, if the discharge does not itch, and if the discharge is periodical, like you see it more just after your periods, like you see it more during your 14, 13, 15, the day of your periods, like you see it more during the last day of your, like about to when you are about to get your periods. If this is the way your discharge is, then probably it is a normal, regular, wide discharge, which is important for your body. So try not to get rid of the wide discharge completely. Yeah, but then if your discharge is smelly, if your discharge is itchy, if you always have the discharge, like there is no change, there is no cyclical change in your discharge. Do you see it the same quantity throughout your cycle? If that is the way it is, or if you see some blood tension at times into the discharge, it means that probably there's an infection. Commonly common what we see is that we see a fungal infection or what we call it as candidial infection. That's one of the most common infection. Rest, there are a couple of vaginitis, trichomonas infection, anaerobic infection. So that we rule out as in how we see the wide discharge, as in how we listen to the patient's complaints. Then we figure out what kind of wide discharge is it. But why I'm emphasizing upon it is only because do not bother about the wide discharge always. Now coming, so this, these were the common problems of a reproductive age group. Once, once the lady is pregnant, all those issues which I was talking to you till now become secondary. And the most important, or when she's become, when she's married, you know, she's planning for pregnancy. So the whole thing of both of them, the partner, the husband and the wife, it goes into this, that how do we prepare ourselves for pregnancy? We see, we, we get a lot of uh, queries regarding this, that how do we prepare ourselves for pregnancy? That particular visit of the patient when she comes asking for this question is called as preconceptional checkup. Before conception, the lady wants to know whether she is fit to conceive, if there is any issues, why she would conceive. It's a very, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a very good uh, step, move forward step. As a gynecologist for me, when my patient comes to me for preconceptional checkup, that's when I'm able to actually scrutinize a high-risk pregnancy, a female who's going to be in high-risk, a low-risk pregnancy, a female who requires some supplements, a female who does not require a female who's already onto some medication which is not safe during pregnancy, so I can change it over to that. So there are a lot of things happening during that preconceptional checkup. Now, having said that, let's not make a make a big deal about it. Plan for pregnancy, getting some tests done for it, and then not planning with extreme stress. That's important. When we plan, we shouldn't be thinking that, you know, it's a robotic action. Today I plan, next time I'm pregnant. No, it doesn't happen like that. You need to give yourself time. Both of you need to give yourself time. You need to have your sexual contact a little more frequently, a couple of months, and that's when you become pregnant. We are human beings. We are not primates. We are not like cats and dogs. Whoever, whenever there's a heat period, we 
they would conceive. No, we are not like that. We have only just in a month, there's just one egg which gets formed in one day on one particular day. So it's a precious thing. It doesn't happen just like that. So trial, a little, a little free hand trial without, without uh, too much thinking about it is important. While you come to prepare for your pregnancy, while you come to your doctor, we, we generally recommend a couple of blood tests like sugar test, thyroid test, anemia test like uh, you know your hemoglobin test. We get to know about your hemoglobin. We also do this sometimes we call it as pap smear test. We do a breast examination. And then we tell you that this is the time when you should be planning for your pregnancy. This is the time when you should be trying to conceive. And this is, this is the good time for you. And I give you the you know, safe try for so many months and then come back to me. If there is a complaint, if a patient says that, doctor, I did have this issue earlier or my husband had this issue earlier, if there is a medical disorder, that is to be taken care, that is to be looked upon while we are talking about this preconceptional checkup. Now, once she conceives, after that, there is a, there's a whole lot of joy and there's, there's a whole lot of new, whole lot of new queries, a big list starting from first trimester to the third trimester. And of course, yes, that has to be, there will be. We are there to answer you. So the first trimester, you know, I always say, you should enjoy your pregnancy. You shouldn't, this is the only reason for which a female comes or a person comes to the hospital without being ill. You're not ill. You're pregnant. It's a physiological thing. We are here to guide you and to make sure that your pregnancy goes safe. You aren't ill. So you shouldn't be thinking that, you know, can I move this way? Can I move that way? Should I eat this? Should I not eat this? Should I drink this? Should I not drink that? Most of the time, the regular norms, uh, we do have the habit to saying it beforehand. Okay, fine, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Couple of don'ts, most of do's. You can do your normal regular activity, you can climb stairs, you can climb down, you can sit down, you can bend yourself, all that okay. We generally tell you that a couple of symptoms, those are normal, like slight vomiting tendency, some giddiness, some abdominal pain is normal. But yeah, we, we tell you, we inform you that if you have any bleeding or spotting, you let us know. Now this bleeding or spotting in the first trimester, that could be a very, very much, I mean, it could be an, a hazard, a health hazard, or a rather a mental health hazard to a patient. Most of them, when they come to us, by then they would have uh, probably done their research, had gone, gone through the, the whole turmoil of the emotion and the knowledge and everything. And most of them, they can't decide that probably this is abortion. Probably I have you know, pregnancy is not going to grow. No, it's not that. Now, 20% of the pregnancies would go for a loss. If 100 females have conceived, 20 would lose it. That is for sure. That's given, written in books. That's there. Who will be that 20%? We don't know. But then, surprisingly, 60% of them will have one or the other time some amount of bleeding or spotting. 60%, it's a huge number. So not that, that everybody who had a spot, who had a mild bleed, will turn up into abortion. So let's not, let's not feel so, I mean, you know, you know, let's be hopeful. At least till we go to the doctor, at least till we get the test done, let's be hopeful. Once a patient comes to us with some bleeding, we generally get a scan done, and most of the time we figure out things by a scanning, by ultrasound scanning. And with that, I mean, people have their own ways of treating, doctors have their own ways of treating, and then we go ahead and do the treatment. So in first trimester, bleeding is one of the issues. The another very common issue, what we see in first trimester is is, you know, is your uh, uh, double marker test and all that. So with each case, we discuss those things. Second trimester is more so a happy trimester, the best trimester. 
you have a lot of kicks of your baby you have a lot of moments you're enjoying it sometimes the kicks are so good or the bulges are so good that your husband is able to touch it and feel it and you're enjoying it third trimester again is a little cumbersome your tummy is big you're unable to sit down properly you're unable to breathe properly you don't know how to sleep every posture becomes difficult and you every time you come to a doctor like me and i say that it's normal it happens you have to go through it forget about it ignore it and trust me that's true most of the time it is true there are very 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 few of the times and thankfully there are very few of the times when we have to take a call about it when we have to think that there's a problem though we look into the matter we look into when somebody says that i'm unable to breathe we we look at her cardiovascular system we look at her respiratory system and most of the time we figure out that it's normal now comes delivery time you know you're prepared at least three or four weeks back prior your doctor says you that see look into these if you have a mucus plug coming out if you have a white discharge uh, if you have a water discharge if you have pain come to me come back directly so that's how the whole pregnancy goes i i can probably keep talking about this thing but then yeah i have some limitations of time so we would go further across it labor room completely a different feeling you are in a different world you do not know what's happening you can scream at your doctor you have all the liberty to scream at your husband you have all the liberty to scream at anybody you shout and you push the baby out and there comes wow a beautiful thing a beautiful gift of god but what happens sometimes it happens that after a day or two you start feeling low you start feeling very low i don't know how many of you have already had a child but there's something called postpartum blues post postpartum depression many of us sink into that you know the the body changes the attention of the whole family goes to the baby and the uh, everybody is like you know baby 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 and the mother feels left out she gets a little bit of postpartum blues we need to hold on there we need to hold it tight you need to know that this whole happiness this whole baby thing is only because of me so i'm not the one who's getting ignored if somebody is giving too much importance to the baby is because is probably giving importance to me and not to the baby so you need to think in that way if you're going into that postpartum blues the next thing postnatal breastfeeding again a difficult thing being a mother i can tell you it's a very very difficult especially with the first child very very difficult you have a lot of queries with that i do tell my patients that listen i mean right now yes may you would not have so much of access to your mother or mother in law but listen to them make a video call to them talk to them ask them what has to be done they are more experienced than us in this regard and most of the time their experience works don't go into that thing that i have to breastfeed and if i could not it's just a sin no please hold on you do your best and whatever comes up just take it don't go into the don't don't start thinking that oh my god i couldn't do anything now i'm talking all this i'm talking very practical thing this happens to us on daily basis in our opt scenario so please don't go into that depression depressing thing that i could not do anything for my baby just because i could not feed my baby no it's not that you did a lot to your baby and you are doing a lot the maximum what you can do you are already doing there comes care of the mother now in order to do all this you know we get so engrossed we get so involved into our baby that we forget ourselves and what happens finally that we get into one thing which is very 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 common is backache now 90% of the females do complain about the backache post delivery and most of them them unfortunately blame it to that probably that spinal needle or the cesarean section or the pushing way of normal delivery no it's not that that is not the reason of your back pain the reason is this that you could not take care of your body well while you were feeding your baby while you are nursing your baby and you did not take your nutrients properly you did not take your calcium you did not take your vitamin d and the most important you did not do your proper exercises 
So do your postnatal exercises. They are very, very important. There's a point called abortion. Uh, I, I, I don't think I have too much of time for that. So we'll, we'll come back if I have to discuss about it again. The, uh, the further issues of reproductive age group. I talked to you about irregular cycles, uh, heavy cycles, scanty cycles. Achha, this, I'm, this I'm talking about the uh, perimenopausal age group that is above the age of 45. Again, the, the age group is not defined, but roughly above the age of 45 and below the age of 55. Earlier, we used to say 50 as the age group of menopause. Now we are, we are shifting across to US side, I mean to uh, Western world, and we are almost saying that 54 or 55 has become the menopausal age group even in India. So during that 45 to 55, cycles again start becoming irregular. You're going towards puberty, you know, your, your, your puberty started, reproductive, and then back to puberty. Puberty style of changes, irregular cycles, heavy cycles, scanty cycles, you may have those breakthrough bleeding, 10 days you bled, five days you bled, stopped for a couple of days, again you had a spot, again you bled, that's called breakthrough bleeding. You may have mild hot flushes because your hormones are changing now. Again, like your puberty. Remember a 14-year-old girl? She's like a live wire. You touch her and she, she blasts. Just like that, a 50-year-old mommy or a 45-year-old mommy at home is the same. You touch her and she's like, come on, get lost. Do I have this? This is the only work I do have, is it? Go do your own work. So she's going into that puberty again. Hot flushes, some mood swings. Her vagina is getting dry. She's getting irritated. She's having loss of libido. Her husband wants to, you know, keep coming near to her. And she's like, go away. I don't need it. And then she feels irritated about it. She feels bad about it. She comes to the doctor, asks us why this is happening. All these changes, whatever I have told you, they all are hormonal changes. They all are mostly because of the hormones. And because of those hormones, the cycles go irregular. They become heavy. They become scanty. They're probably going to stop again. And that is why before that, they're showing all those nakras, so-called nakras into, in the cycle. Now, when the patient comes with a very heavy cycle or a very scanty cycle, a lot of breakthrough bleeding, we do get some tests done. We do get scans done. There could be a chance of fibroid. There could be a chance of endometriosis a different entity of gynecological issue it could be that and if at all there is anything of that kind it needs some amount of medical or surgical management hot flushes mood swings can be uh, not always they require medical treatment they require some amount of like yoga meditation food changes less of uh, less of uh, so-called spicy food, more of uh, uh, protein-rich diet, soya, soya beans, tofu, spinach, a lot of things. They all work out. They do work. So those to be taken care of. Dry vagina, vaginal irritation is again because of hormonal changes. Hormones are drying down and that is why it is happening. When that does happen, we uh, we give some amount of emollients or sometimes we give hormonal replacement therapy also. If the hormones are dying down fast and the lady is unable to cope up with that, there is something called HRT, hormonal replacement therapy. I don't know how many of you have seen in sex in the city. There is a huge role of HRT into that. Again, loss of libido, exactly the same thing. Keep yourself calm, keep yourself cool. Try to make time for yourself. Look at yourself. Give yourself importance and probably the libido would be better. The last one, postmenopausal. You know, you can see the last line. Look, mom, I'm a child again. Now that lady who was a small child, she's becoming a child again. Her bleeding has stopped. She's getting into severe mood swings like a small child. She has a lot of hot flushes. Her bones have become brittle again, weak again, like a small child. She's having that memory loss. She's gone into 
going into Alzheimer's kind of thing. So she's, she's going back, she's going back, she's going to be again a two-year-old girl, having no, nothing about the sex, nothing about the libido, just bothered about even a small change in her body. She's bothered, she wants to talk to you, she wants to ask you questions. You need to answer her. You need to get her to the doctor. You shouldn't be thinking that anyway she has attained menopause. Now what is there to take her to the gynecologist? We do have a lot of answers for them. And we do feel at times bad for them. So please get them to the hospital. The one thing we should not be ignoring. Now, I'm sure none of you are in postmenopausal age group. But then your mother or your granny, somebody would be there in, your post-menopausal, in the postmenopausal age group at your family. So one thing which cannot be ignored is that postmenopausal screen spotting. If a female in your family, once she has stopped her periods, she says, I'm again having small spotting. Please don't ignore it. It actually could be a very early symptom of a cancer. So that should not be ignored. Osteoporosis or breaking bones. Calcium should be in good quantity. Vitamin D has to be given. If there is a family history of osteoporosis, then patient has to be given some couple of extra medications also. Memory loss, Alzheimer's, I always say my patient, even during pregnancy, I say her, you know, solve a lot of puzzles, solve a lot of mathematics, your child will become brainy. And that also helps her to keep her away from the, from Alzheimer's for a long, long time. So, you know, while you are on your computer, while you are on your laptop, do a lot of, do a lot of puzzling, do a lot of uh, solving questions or Play with your child with, with solving puzzles. That is a very good, uh, you know, preventive factor from, from having Alzheimer's. Thankfully, in India, Alzheimer's is less. Thanks to probably a joint family or a lot of sas bahu ke jhagde whatsoever. But then uh, Alzheimer's is less in India. So look, mom, I'm again a child. I'm craving for my food. Your, your daddy, she, she says, you know, you're going out. Please get me one more ice cream. So that's how we end this beautiful journey from puberty to postmenopause. And um, I wish all of you a very beautiful womanhood. Do not, uh, you know, don't take even a step of womanhood as a burden. Each part is beautiful. Your 20s was also the same way beautiful as your 30s would be even more beautiful at your 40s, would be much more beautiful at your 50s. And at 60s, you would feel that, oh, I've seen this, done that. I know what you're talking about, a 16-year-old girl. I've done that in my life. With this, I would end up my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot.